Welcome to Maxwell Institute Conversations, special videocast episodes of the Maxwell Institute podcast, hosted by Terrell Givens and created in collaboration with Faith Matters Foundation. You can watch this episode in your podcast app, or if you're on the run, listen to the audio version. This episode features Dr. Thomas Wayman of Brigham Young University. A lot has changed for Tom since this interview was recorded last year. He was a professor of ancient scripture working on a new translation of the New Testament intended for Latter-day Saints. Now he's teaching classical studies at BYU, and his translation's been published by the Religious Studies Center in Deseret Book, just in time for Latter-day Saints Sunday School's focus on the New Testament. I want to hear about the experience of rendering that translation, and I want to know if you can kind of summarize any of the key findings or patterns that were new to you in your own working through the Greek? Yeah, um, one thing that jumps out as I went through it, and this was not a positive thing, I, I translated it all from Matthew 1.1 to Revelation 22 in a, in a process of five years, and, and in doing that, I was surprised I, on a thing I never had a real strong opinion about was on the Pauline authorship of the letters. And after sitting down, starting Romans 1 and hitting all the way to um, Philemon, I have a very strong opinion now that Paul did not write some of the letters attributed to him. Find out how Tom Wayman reckoned with this and other interesting facets of the New Testament in this episode of Maxwell Institute Conversations, part of the Maxwell Institute podcast and sponsored by the Faith Matters Foundation. Hello and welcome to another conversation. My name is Terrell Givens. My guest today in the studio is Thomas Waymond, a professor of uh, New Testament. Yes, New at, Testament studies. At, at New Testament studies at Brigham Young University. Uh, happy to have you with us today. You're our first biblical guru that we've had. Well, thanks. Good to be here. We'd like to, to start, Tom, by getting to know you a little bit, um, talk a little bit about your background and uh, if you could give us a kind of a, a quick trajectory of your, of your spiritual and intellectual formation, and uh, I'd be curious to know especially what seminal moments or events in your life moved you in the direction of something like New Testament studies. Yeah, um, I, I have to say I was inspired by a faculty member early on. I was a Greek student uh, planning to go into classics, and my most interesting professor he would have these these kind of asides where they're just intense, and he was so passionate about it. And, and I, where was this? This was at Riverside, UC Riverside. Okay. And I pulled him aside after class one day, and I just said, "Hey, Professor Jackson, what do you do?" And he he was a New Testament professor, and he he kind of opened doors for me um, at Claremont. He was a professor also at Claremont, and I just wanted that same passion, and I had that instinctively in my own religion. But I didn't have it for my academic subject. And what was the course this was? Uh, this was a Plato course. He, we were Plato. translating Plato, and, and when he had a word that was fascinating to him, he just, wow, it just opened up a whole sense of meaning. He would quote things like the Bible and other things, uh, the New Testament, in explaining these words. So were you a classics major? I was, yeah, and I graduated from classics, but um, he, he shared with me, late, I, this was my fourth year of study, and he said, you know, the best training for a New Testament program is classics. And uh, he, he said that would open up a lot of doors in academia. And sure enough, I applied and uh, with his encouragement and was accepted into a PhD in, in religion, at New Claremont? Testament studies at Claremont. Now, were you already a, a Latter-day Saint? I was. Um, served a mission in Italy and grew up Latter-day Saint in Southern California. Now, see, here's a little bit of a difference between us. I, one of the most exciting courses I took at, at BYU was with Wilfred Griggs, and he was perennially late to class, mm. and and almost without exception, he'd come running in, his hair kind of tussled, and, and he'd just be beaming, and he'd say, oh, I'm so sorry, I got in the midst of translating this Coptic document that was so exciting, I was talking about eternal marriage, and you know, wow. and I never saw that level of enthusiasm, or seldom did, and I thought, I want to do what Hugh Nibley and Wilfred Griggs did. But then I ran into Greek. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, I just, it, it defeated me. I mean, I studied it long enough to become passingly competent, but... but. Well, that, that would, we have similar experiences in that sense. It was his raw passion. And when you got him talking about religious aspects of, of uh, ancient Greece history or even New Testament, he just, you could just tell that's what, what yeah. drove him. Yeah. And 
probably really, and this this kind of gets to where I, I my faith journey began. I obviously was a believing Latter Day Saint, and I had served a mission and uh, was recently married. And I start in this program of religion, and immediately am faced with contradictions to my own religion. So I've I've, per, I've perpetuated certain historical narratives, both on my mission and otherwise, about how early Christianity worked and that. And immediately, you know, I have people like Jim Robinson and especially Burton Mack, who is kind of controver- controversial and confrontational to traditional faith. And he, he's trying to disrupt faith narratives. And I started to compartmentalize. And I think it's a coping strategy that so many, you know, young grad students use to say, I don't understand that right now. I'll put that on the shelf. But it quickly became apparent to me that I had a whole room. And in this room, I had to close the door. And and I had to kind of exist in a world where I believed, but I also had these things that I couldn't deal with at that time. Now, you probably know Bart Ehrman's experience in this regard. I do, yes. Because he has spoken and written about that. And Bart Ehrman is probably the most, would you say, maybe the most famous New Testament atheist (laughs) scholar? Yes, Um, yes. And maybe agnostic. I don't know. Maybe agnostic. Sometimes I read him both ways. But, um, you know, he famously describes this discontinuity, this cognitive dissonance that he resolves by just jettisoning his Christian beliefs. And I would say, sorry to interrupt, but I would say that's the easy solution. Yeah. And it's just hanging right there. Well, I can just push it all aside. It's all done and clean. Yeah, Gene England used to refer to the easy luxury of disbelief and cynicism. Absolutely. There is, there is something simple about that. It's always that fruit that's just right there. I could, I could solve all the, the problems. But so, yeah, so talk some more about how, how you're working through this, how, what kind of anguish you went through uh, in the process. For me, um, something happened that kind of shifted the tone for me. I had a professor, his name's Greg Riley, and uh, he's still at Claremont, um, good friend, and, and he had a student confront him in class one day, and Greg had been pr- pushing this notion that Jesus had taught a gospel to the poor and a gospel of poverty, and him, he himself was probably personally quite poor. And this student raised his hand and said, Professor Riley, if we if we teach that in our congregations, we'll never gain any offerings. And um, he said, Professor Riley, do you even believe in Jesus? It's it really disruptive. And uh, Greg, Greg got pretty frustrated and said, you know, if you don't teach the historical Jesus, you'll lose your soul. And it just really caught me. And he went on to say, I do not believe in the Jesus of faith, but I believe in the Jesus of history. And as a Mormon, there's so many things going on there. This just idea that a person could believe in Jesus, but not believe in faith and and believe in salvation. So can you expand a little bit on what you mean and how you have experienced the Jesus of faith as a problem? I have, and and that's what was happening up until that moment and has continued to happen, is I realized in my in my faith, the Jesus of history and the Jesus of faith were the same thing. They were always existed in the same sphere. And as people pointed out, um, like Mark three, Jesus becomes angry. That didn't fit my my idea of a Jesus who is compassionate. He grows angry. The next uh, three verses later, it says that he's out of his mind. And that didn't fit my, my idea of a, of a Jesus who was both, you know, continuous in his, in his divinity to humanity to, to post-resurrection. And, and a lot of things like disciples who don't understand the mark in disciples. And these were always confronting my Jesus of faith. And I wanted to correct the Jesus of history by the Jesus of faith. And as many people will find, and I... So, in other words, you wanted to read the Bible through the lens of a Mormon testimony. Yes, I was doing that. And I I don't mean to be a nihilist in this sense, but that's not a productive way forward. And and I I found something in Riley that was just powerful for me. There's something powerful, real, tangible, believable about the Jesus of history. And for the first time, I realized maybe the Jesus of history could help inform my faith rather than revise. And it opened up a whole new way to think of it. Kind of paradigm shift. He was 
passionate about the Jesus of history. And when I spoke earlier of Professor Jackson, passionate about Greek, Riley was deeply passionate about Jesus of history. One of the themes that seems to emerge in so many of these conversations we're having is that as Latter-day Saints encountering a secular world, uh, an academic environment, we feel threatened or challenged. And we see the confrontation between evolution and Adam or the, the documentary hypothesis and our understanding of the Old Testament as a, as a threat and as a moment of crisis. And what I love about what I hear unfolding here with you is that you're, you're, you're describing this as an opportunity, as a window that opens up into beautiful new possibilities rather than a fearful retrenchment. Absolutely. And I, I have to say over time in looking back, the only thing that probably saved me were, well, I guess, two things. Patience. I really had to go a long time where I don't know was the most hopeful and faithful answer I could give. It, it was an answer I, I don't know, but I hope. And I continue to define my belief as hope. I hope these things are true. The other thing that really helped me, and I, I hope that this works for, for others, but it worked for me, is I had spiritual experiences in my life. I've since had them. And I refused to renegotiate those to reconceptualize those and to become critical of them. And while I shelved the historical Jesus, I also has shelved my faith experiences and protected them. And so there was always a sense, I have something there. I can't describe it fully right now, but it helped me be patient and cautious in throwing it all out, taking the easy way out. Yeah. Can you give us an, a, a concrete example or two of something that you feel you have discovered or discerned or accepted in what you're calling the historical Jesus that on the surface seems to be out of harmony with the conventional narratives we tell in our own faith. Yeah, um, and, I, and I hadn't thought this through before, so mm -hmm. it may not be the best example, but it's one that occurs to me and I wrestle with till today, I'm trying to understand this, is I think a Mormonism, but most faith traditions believe that Jesus has a continual view of atonement in mind from day one as a 12-year-old young man, and maybe even earlier that, that from Luke's, Luke 2 forward, he, he knows, he has his father's mission in mind. And when you start looking at historical Jesus, he may have been crucified unaware that Eli, Eli, Lama Sabachthani on the cross might be why didn't you rescue me from this cross? Those are stunningly different. And is it possible that, that Jesus did save mankind, redeemed mankind, but was not fully aware of where it was going? It's possible, even in our own conception, to be foreordained without a full knowledge of what that foreordination entails. Absolutely, right? but would you agree that Humanity, that model works for humanity, but does it work equally for divinity? Well, we, 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 we know he grows from grace to grace, and I think somehow we have jumped from there to the assumption that he, had, he reached a fullness of knowledge and self-understanding before the cross. But that's not actually textually indicated anywhere, is it? It's not, no. And, <clears throat> and I just remember still even the class where it happened, where... My professor said simply, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani is frustration. My God, my God, why have you left me here alone? And it's a cry of, God, I thought the millennium happened now. Yeah. I thought redemption was you taking me down. This is, this is remarkable. Um, I wish we had Brian Krzysztof's painting here of the descent from the cross to illustrate what you're talking about because, mm. because he speaks very much in a similar register. He says that in his art, to the extent that he addresses uh, the theme of Christ, resurrection, crucifixion, um, he says he thinks that, that by sanitizing those episodes of the genuine anguish that he would have experienced as well as his disciples and maybe even the angels of heaven, we, uh, we have a kind of post-production sanitization Mm. of the whole process that, that, uh, that detracts, not from his divinity, but it, det it detracts from the gift in some ways, because we have, right, we've diminished yeah. the real cost that might have been entailed. 
I don't think so many people ever, or very many people ever think, was Jesus as surprised by Easter as Mary was? And that's yeah. a really powerful nuance. And you can see why the story, and you become very aware of this in New Testament studies, the Gospels are not as sanitized as you would expect. Yeah. They leave a lot of remnants of the historical person navigating his own experience. Yeah, yeah. I'm reading a new translation of the New Testament right now by David Bentley Hart, <clears throat> and he sets out very explicitly, he says, to try to, to, to strip the New Testament of the overlays uh, that he says really begin in the Reformation and to get back to a, a Christ that he says is much more shocking and radical and uncomfortable, and that's the word he keeps coming back to. He says there's something radically uncomfortable about this gospel that Jesus is teaching. For example, in his translation, Jesus isn't condemning love of riches. He's not condemning excessive preoccupation with riches. He's condemning riches, <laughs> that riches themselves are an indication that something is wrong in, in, in this world. Um, you, I understand, are working on, or have you finished your own translation of the New Testament? I have. I, I finished it and kind of navigating the production, our publication process. I want, I want to hear about the experience of rendering that translation, and I want to know if you can kind of summarize any of the key findings or patterns that were new to you in your own working through the Greek. Yeah, um, one thing that jumps out as I went through it, and this was not a positive thing. I, I translated it all from Matthew 1.1 to Revelation 22 in a, in a process of five years. And, and in doing that, I was surprised I, on a thing I never had a real strong opinion about was on the Pauline authorship of the letters. And after sitting down, starting Romans 1 and hitting all the way to um, Philemon, I have a very strong opinion now that Paul did not write some of the letters attributed to him. There, in, as a translator, Hebrews cannot be Paul. Now, it could be Paul in some way that he didn't write it himself or he dictated it or something or somebody gathered it, but there, is, there are fantastic differences in style, for example, in Ephesians or Colossians. Um, okay. Sorry to interrupt, but can I pause here because this is such an important topic that has all kinds of ramifications, it seems to me, for Latter-day Saints. <clears throat> it, it reminds me, <clears throat> excuse me, it reminds me of the question of Job. Is Job a historical character? And you have mm -hmm. people saying, well, Joseph referred to Job, right. so we know he's historical. And I think, yeah, well, Joseph could have said, I'm as strong as Hercules, and that wouldn't mean that he really believes in Hercules. Absolutely. Um, in the same way, Joseph frequently referred to Paul in the context of being author of any number of New Testament letters. Many have concluded from that, that that an inspired prophet is telling us Paul really is the author of all those letters attributed to him. Um, you're saying one can be an absolutely faithful, believing Latter-day Saint and not believe that, that, that Paul is necessarily the author of those letters attributed to him, as we typically um, assume, right, in lesson manuals and, and right, treatments right. of Paul. Yeah, that's especially true in Ephesians and Colossians. Um, you, I, I don't know how to kind of help capture the depth or nuance here, but Ephesians starts with a sentence that lasts 10 verses. Off the top of my head, I believe it's 10 verses. Wonderfully complex, good Greek, carefully articulated. And then the Paul of Corinthians, he leaves out main verbs. He wants you to supply them. He doesn't write like that. It's choppy. It's, it's nuanced. It's really thoughtful. But the Greek isn't really quite, frankly, that good. Um, you get to, to Ephesians, Colossians, whole new terms. He doesn't use verbs even to mean the same thing that he used them in Romans, for example. And so, yes, absolutely, as a believing Latter-day Saint, the meaning of Ephesians is intact. Nothing changes if Paul wrote it or someone named Apollos wrote it or somebody named Mark wrote it. I think what, what we miss when we try to say, well, it had to be Paul to be meaningful. I think we, we missed the, the primary fact that history has proven there's meaning in this text. Latter-day Saint narrative has proven there's meaning in this text. And as a believer, I find meaning, but I'm confident Paul, Paul didn't Damn write it. <clears throat> okay, you discovered, at least to your own satisfaction, that authorship is different than what we had 
than what I believe. thought. Yeah. Tradition. What else? Anything else in terms of, of the nature of Christ himself? Um, and this one might come as a bit of a shock, and I, I don't say it to be shocking, but I came away with a much stronger feeling that the gospel authors, when they speak of Jesus' words, are citing from something. There's a real consistency in the words of Jesus, but the narrative to encapsulate that is clearly influenced by the individual. Are you taking us in the direction of a Q text? Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm much more <clears throat> convinced today than there's, that there is Q. But so mo- talk a little bit about what that is for people who, who don't know. Yeah, very briefly, there's a theory that Matthew, Mark, and Luke um, are genetically related in some fashion, and there's a lot of discussion on how that happens. One of the primary solutions today is that Mark is the first gospel written and that Matthew and Luke both borrow from Mark, adapt Mark, correct Mark, and then draw from a body of sayings that um, exist out there, either written form or oral, called Q. And Q simply means as an abbreviation for source in, in German. And what, I, what I'm kind of hinting at here is that as I, I get to translating the gospels and I'm doing it fairly quickly, it's amazing to see how poor of a writer Mark is. But then he quotes Jesus, and as a translator, something, he has something there that he's not manipulating. You can tell Mark, Mark misconjugates verbs, and you mentioned your challenge with, with Greek earlier. For example, in the story of the uh, stilling of the storm, he has a plural subject with a singular verb, if I remember it right off the top of my head. He just misconjugates it. But then when he quotes Jesus, there's a different tone of the Greek. It's a different way he writes it. And what I, I guess I hadn't really seen first person, this idea that there were the sayings of Jesus and Mark has access to those and he adopts those. But he's clearly writing a story to linearly develop that. And Matthew comes along, obviously, and says, I don't really think you got the linear order quite right. I think you, I think it needs to be revised, and Luke does even further. And that really drove home to me that there's a sense that the sayings of Jesus are what this is about, but now they're trying to make sense of those. Right. Let's talk a little bit about the book of Romans. This is um, undoubtedly the most important book in the New Testament for the history of Christianity, would you agree? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely, no no hesitation. And uh, if you could just enlighten us a little bit about recent scholarship that is radically revisioning, reinterpreting the Book of Romans, uh, the new perspective on Paul movement, and uh, which to my mind is is, uh, like manna from heaven for Mormonism because we've been reading Paul differently from the beginning than the Protestant tradition has. Um, and now you've had firsthand experience of going back and reworking the Book of Romans from, from the Greek. So talk a little bit about, about what we should know as Latter-day Saints about this controversy. Yeah, um, <clears throat> and maybe just a simple def- definition would be helpful, and please jump in if um, you've dealt, sounds like you've dealt with some new perspective and, and there's something now emerging as the radical new perspective. So um, quite simply, I think, the question becomes, does Damascus constitute a conversion for Paul away from Judaism towards a new religion? And the old perspective on Paul is that Judaism is done away with and Paul enters a new religion defined as the way and eventually Christianity. And the new perspective on Paul defines that as saying that Paul never left Judaism or or in a, in a way it's more linear, that there's not a radical departure. Um, and, and in that sense, I think people need to understand that a lot of this goes back to Barth and his commentary on Romans, the idea that Christianity has to deal with supersessionism, the idea that Judaism is, if you will, obsolete, done away with, etc. An old covenant. An old like. covenant. And Mormonism has a lot of that language, and the problem is it becomes a justifiable anti-Semitism. If it's done away with, if it's obsolete, some have argued Christianity can then allow itself to persecute. Them. Wouldn't you say that Mormonism escapes this problem to a large measure 
insofar as the Book of Mormon collapses the Old and New Covenant and says there isn't really a difference. We're, we're, still, we're still imbricated in the New and Everlasting Covenant, which is both. And that's why in the Book of Mormon, they're, they're, the Law of Moses and the coming Christ, old, literal, historical Israel actually persists into the New. Um, Absolutely. I would actually say Mormonism has a brilliant solution. The Book of Mormon being this bridge that the Old and New Covenants are a covenant. Right. And right. It, it is a great solution. I think what stood in the way, and I, and I hope people will engage new translations, is that I think personally, this is me personally, that the KJV translation of Romans has made it untouchable for Mormons, impenetrable of yeah. what it means. And, and this language of justification and foreordination and other things have almost made, I think, Romans unusable. Now, is this in part because through Luther's lens, what's happening in Romans is that we are leaving behind the Jewish preoccupation with works, well, but it's not, it's not Jewish for, for Luther, right? It's just works, right? right? Salvation right. by works. And we have this new covenant of grace. And so am I correct in understanding that, that the very question, are you saved by works or grace, is a false dichotomy based on a misreading of Paul? So, Terrell, I, yeah, this is a fantastic question, and, and false dichotomy might not be strong enough. Um, one of the things that Paul does that I think so many people have missed in this letter, and, and I, I understand there's whole faith traditions built around this discussion, and I don't want to diminish their interest in this topic, but as a Mormon, as a Latter-day Saint looking at it, Paul is wrestling with the idea that sin has defined in himself feelings of guilt, feelings of, of worth, feelings of effectively valuation of self. And he does a lot of this in Romans 7 and 8. And, and he sees Christ as triumphant over guilt, over this, this challenge that the law, if we allow the law to be the only definition of righteousness, becomes effectively a dictionary of what's wrong with you. And he says we have to move into Christ. We have to move into the idea that Christ opens new vistas for, for us. And, and I, but he's not saying righteousness doesn't matter. No. And Christ will impute his grace and that is what is going to save us. Yeah, grace isn't for Paul, I don't believe, a cup that's empty that you fill with Christ and now all of a sudden you're, you're full of grace. Right. And I don't think Paul... And I, I don't, I've said this because I'm reflecting now Riley, who I, I shared with you earlier some of the things. He, said, he would say flippantly in class, why is it that people in the New Testament who promote grace work harder than anybody else? Which Paul literally says, I have worked harder than anyone else. Yeah. And that, that's a really powerful notion. He was making a jab, you know, obviously at, at certain faith traditions. But it, it stuck home with me. He's right. Something's driving Paul. And it's not a sense that I've been filled with grace and replaced works in my life. It's that works are defined now with a different purpose. Yeah. yeah. So you have some scholars today in the New Perspective on Paul movement, some who have reviewed, for example, David Bentley Hart's translation, who have said what he demonstrates with a more accurate translation that isn't viewed through the Reformation lens is that the Reformation project is not biblical in the way that it was thought. You have some people in this movement who are actually saying was the entire Reformation a mistake. Now, it seems to me, with all due respect to our, our Protestant brothers and sisters and recognition of, of, of their goodness and the value of many of, of, of Protestantism's founding ideas, but basically this new perspective on Paul Blum suggests that Latter-day Saints had it right all along and that Catholicism was in many, in most instances, in this regard at least, closer to a, a, a true New Testament understanding of what Paul was about than Luther and his successors. Is that is that accurate? Yeah, I mean, obviously, it's a very complex narrative, and and uh, I I want to pick just a few threads out of that. Obviously, I I don't want to comment. I'm I'm not a you know Reformationist, and when we get that far, I think there's some stories there that I don't fully you know, understand the background too, but if I think about what you've asked, what's the historical relationship of Romans and its 
its representation of Pauline faith and then how has that been interpreted and in how Mormons react. My sense is that what, what Paul is doing is saying that there are recoverable elements of Judaism that need to continue on concept of community of faith. That's very important in Romans. He deals with this foreordination uh, or preordinate, predestination uh, concept. He deals with Israel as a people, but he can never get away from the notion that Gentiles need to be in the house of Israel. He doesn't want to get rid of the idea that there is an Israel. But, but see, are you aware of the extent to which you're channeling Joseph Smith? <laughs> sure. I mean, this is what's so remarkable to me is that Joseph Smith somehow was immune to that Protestant revisionism of Paul, and he's reading Paul in that same way. And that's why, again, in the Book of Mormon, it's like, no, we need temples, we need covenants, we need Israel to somehow be assimilated into this new gospel context. Um, even the priesthood offices of the Old Testament, the, the ordinances and sacrifices, there's this complete assimilation, not a succession of one by the other. You know, absolutely. I, I think that that fits well. I think another powerful thread is, in this story is how much then does the past define the current movement? And that's where Paul can again be insightful. He is saying that I am okay to revise my understanding of my previous faith through revelation. That's what Damascus becomes for him. I think he's talking about Damascus in particular in uh, in Romans, when he talks about his former self, he says, "Quote: This will be this will be one of the most challenging passages in Romans." He says, "There was a time when I didn't have; I was apart from the law," and that's a fairly good translation. Uh, it can be without the law, and and folks have really scholars have really wondered what does he mean. And I don't know what your your thoughts are on that. My sense is is he's either saying that at one time I was completely disobedient. Or he's saying, at one time I was living the law, but not the law in the way Christ would have me live it. And that's a powerful revision of Judaism had much to offer, but lived without Christ, it's not what it needs or could be. Right, right. Which I think the Book of Mormon offers this, this perspective. The law lived in Christ is a different thing than the law lived. Right, right. Um, would it make sense to say, for example, President Uchtdorf in a recent talk said that as Latter-day Saints we have to recognize that salvation is not bought with a currency of obedience. In other words, the law isn't something we fulfill in order so that God can dispense salvation. <clears throat> but if we're living the law in Christ, then we are letting it shape us and constitute us into Christ-like beings. Um, I think that's how I like to see the law. It's not, it's not a set of requirements we fulfill. It's the tutor yeah. that, that shapes and, and molds us in new ways. Going back to this translation um, that I did and an insight that I gained, uh, I documented, I believe, all of, the, all of the echoes of the New Testament in the Book of Mormon and, and list those in the footnotes. And one of the things that was interesting in this topic on that is that a much of First and Second Nephi is influenced by 1 Corinthians language on salvation and bodies and how, how righteousness is defined and his, his famous you know, statements on works and, and whatnot are Corinthian in, it, in their nature. So what do you make of that? So one thing I make that the prophet Joseph Smith obviously has the language of the KJV in, in his vocabulary and that comes through in the Book of Mormon. But I think primarily if we're thinking about the Corinthian context, um, in particular, how is righteousness defined? It's very clear to me that 1 Corinthians is a problematic event for Paul. He has a, this wonderful spiritual-filled ministry there. He departs. He finds out that the church is now involved in some pretty reprehensible behaviors. And he, he's really reprimanding the lowest common denominator. And to take that setting and then say from that we're going to extract our definition of works and grace, I think we have to at some point realize that, that by definition, that's not, if you will, an abstract mission statement of what, how faith is obtained. That's telling people that are struggling, 
here are some points you need to observe. And so these famous statements, you know, we're saved after all we can do and that, I think is almost, if you will, reprimand. Maybe not as much here as how I would say it to someone who had never dealt with the Corinthian problems. Hmm. So it changes the way I guess I read. And strangely, by the way, you see it in Alma also when he's reprimanding his son. Corinthians comes back into that language heavily. And you see it in those places. Right, right. Let me back up and ask just a couple of general questions. What, What would you like to see happen that would improve our engagement with the scriptures in formal settings? Yeah, a church. And I, and I can only speak for myself. Um, one of the challenges to me as a Bible scholar, and this comes full circle from where we started, is that Mormonism has promoted a, a very dis- clear historical narrative for how Bible works, how the Old Testament works, etc. And I think people wrestle with faith when they find out that history doesn't fit that narrative well. So they judge things by, this is the narrative I read in, in books and in manuals and I was taught. And, and when something doesn't fit it, then they're willing to say, wow, my faith has misrepresented this, it's not nuanced, it's not careful. And one of the challenges with that, in my opinion, is it's unnecessary. I have confidence in history But I know it's going to change, right? We all know as historians, historical record is very spotty, and so we piece it together the best we can. But if the historical record is radically revised, my faith still remains intact. I, I, I think we need to get away, is what I'm saying, from the idea that if the Book of Mormon's historicity, if you will, is different than we thought, if the New Testament Jesus is a little different than we thought, that we somehow can't have faith in that, that we somehow, faith and history are the same. I've heard Mormonism is history. I I hear that phrase used, and I cringe every time I hear that, because then people say, well, if the history is different than I thought, then my faith is linked to that. Yeah, I see that both ways. I know that Grant McMurray, the president of the Reorganized Church, once said in Kirtland at a big, uh, well-attended conference, he said, history as theology is perilous. <clears throat> and I, I, I agree that it is in the way that you describe, um, but I, th- I think there's a middle ground that we have to, we have to stake out and, and maintain because I think Mormonism is history in the same way that Christianity is history. I mean, it's predicated on a real historical event called the resurrection, and that's non-negotiable in the same way that some of, some of the, the core fundamentals of Mormonism are. But I think, I think we're on the same page when it comes to too much emphasis on a historical narrative as the blueprint of our faith. Yeah, I mean, I guess in, a, in an example, resurrection is non-negotiable. I 100% agree. But is resurrection on Sunday the, the absolute right, point? Right, right. Is it what if it were Monday? Right. And that, that's what I feel I'm seeing. I, I watch, and, and maybe this is getting a little bit out of my area of expertise, I watch the the confrontations among believing Mormons of where the Book of Mormon narrative took place. And to me, I, I, don't, I can't see the value in that because I've missed now the importance of the, the story itself. And so having done studies in, in religious, you know, having done religious studies, there's, there's a whole value in text apart from his, its historical context. Right, right. And that's what I think we can recover. Well, let me ask this. How, how did we come to where we are in terms of our theology of biblical interpretation? Um, you know, you could go to the Catholic Church and you could find papal pronouncements yeah. and ex cathedra statements and magisteria, but we just have this kind of ad hoc theology, right? What, um, I'll give you my view and then you, 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 yeah, you, you critique it. That. But my sense is that we have departed immensely from Joseph Smith's pronouncements in this regard. I mean, the Book of Mormon itself begins, right, with a set of expressions of biblical inadequacy, biblical insufficiency, biblical distortions and omissions. Mm-hmm. Joseph said one time, there, this, the, many, m- much of the Bible does not accord with the revelations of the Holy Spirit. 
to me. He deems the Bible, Old and New Testament, so inadequately translated that he sets out to remake the, 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 the Bible through inspiration and scholarship alike. He continues to pour forth a stream of supplementary revelations that augment the biblical narrative, like the Book of Moses. Um, and yet somehow between that era and the present, we've, we've almost acquired a kind of fundamentalist devotion to biblical literalism. Um, how did that happen? Do you agree that's a problem? No, I, I, I like the way you've paraphrased it or, or summarized this problem. Um, I'm going to draw a little bit on my research on the Joseph Smith translation, and one of the things that's happened even in the translation process I've worked on is Joseph sees all text, in my opinion, as living text, so that the Bible is drawn on in the Book of Mormon linguistically. I don't know, I don't think there's any of him writing in the Bible open and him copying. I, I really want to eschew that, but Bible is coming through him, and he, it comes into the Book of Mormon, and it, it is, in a sense, rethought, engaged. That happens again in the Joseph Smith translation, and it happens again in the Pearl of Great Price. And I think what that set up is a model that history and Bible are interpreted through prophetic means. And, and I'm probably going out on a limb here, and I, w- I want to be careful and just say, for the record, I'm a believer. The challenge becomes are all the prophetic statements than historical statements? And I think there's a stance among Latter-day Saint historians to be in a defensive posture of when when a statement is made over the pulpit in Salt Lake about something that has historical implications. Do I need to defend that? Do I need to do I need to find a historical situation to make that real? Um, If somebody cites a Greek word and and it's a little different in the, in, the, in the Greek, do I need to critique that? And, yeah. and I really think we need to stop doing that. I think apostles exist as witnesses. And I think Joseph Smith had this very vibrant view to faith. I don't think Joseph made the claim, and, and I'm not a Joseph Smith scholar, so correct me if I'm wrong, that I am a historian prophet. I don't think that's the fundamental of Joseph. I no. think, I think what <clears throat> Joseph is saying that li- religion is living and text is living, and I'm part of. I'm a participant, and that's a very different thing to me. And so, I want going back to what you said. I want history to remain intact. I want it to remain important. But I don't, I'd like Mormons not to be afraid of theology. Right. I'd like them to engage <clears throat> text in other ways too. Right. This has been a really rich and good conversation. Um, I want to round it out with two, two questions I want to ask you. This immediate context aside, what do you think we as Latter-day Saints are doing well as a people? You know, I, I'm, I, that's a challenging question for me, not because I don't have examples, but kind of finding one that's meaningful. And one of the things that I I think is still so powerful and vibrant about Mormonism is that God can interrupt time and space and testify and that there's a sense of a Latter-day Saint can be touched by a, by a spiritual moment in their life and that enables them to see. There, there's a sense of conduit with God. and. I really like that. I I guess the way I would say it in a more articulate way is that Mormonism was founded on a question. And if that's that's meaningful to me, even this far along in my academic training, my faith started with a question as Joseph's did. And so for that, I think there's a lot, a lot to offer. Good. What in your heart of hearts do you find yourself wishing we did better? Wishing we did better. Um, that's a good question. <laughs> you know, really, um, I guess having finished a translation, I wish Paul were more part of our, our language of Scripture. I think a lot of Christians exist as Pauline Christians, and I think Mormons exist like Catholics exist a lot more as Gospels Christians. And then you have your whole other subset of apocalyptic, and that's probably very simplistic, but Mormonism has the potential to engage all three and not be one or the other. And Paul, I'm afraid, 
it's just not as important in our everyday vocabulary, the way we define faith, the way we categorize goodness and righteousness. I, I wish he were more part of it. Yeah. Would you say that, that, that Latter-day Saints tend to have a more scripture-centered practice than is often common in Christendom, but maybe with less critical openness and sophistication than, than we could have? Yeah, and then of course there'll always be this issue: Can we have more sophistication? And I'm, I'm probably not as concerned at the moment with that. I mean, that's an important point. But Latter-day Saints are doing a good job about having all of us read Scripture. Yeah, I wish there were more. Sure, but that's yeah. what I do for a living. Right. The reality is, we we read a lot of Scripture. That's bad. healthy. Okay. Last question. Uh, Christopher Stendhal used the expression "holy envy." Um, of what faith tradition or practice outside of Mormonism do you have holy envy? Yeah, um, maybe catch you a little off guard. I love public ritual. I love, I love high church, and there's a participation element sometimes outside of sacrament. I think we miss temples are very private. Um, there's that has a great kind of ritual structure, but. The idea that, that we all participate in an ordinance is a little bit simplified in sacrament. It's quick, yeah, it's done. Yeah. At the first part of the meeting, we move on. And, and the, I like the concept of, if you will, high church. Yeah. Um, well, you're speaking to somebody here who sure speaks that language. i <clears throat> married to a Catholic. I, I can't help but have come to appreciate what she has left behind and feels a longing for. We celebrate Christmas every year. We open our Christmas season by attending the Lessons and Carols service at the University of Richmond. And uh, it's a candlelight service where it's concluded with everyone in the congregation joining in a hymn and, and raising their candle. And there's something so magnificent mm -hmm. about that collective gesture of, of worship and celebration. Yeah, so it brings I, your Old Testament back. Ritual is the center yeah, of faith. And yeah, now yeah. we're participants again. Yeah, yeah. Well, Tom, thanks for being with us today. I, thanks for having I, me, Tom. I have to say that uh, I've known you for a number of years, and I've always admired you as one of the most judicious uh, and wisest voices in, in the area of scriptural commentary and thoughtfulness. Thanks. So, I appreciate that. Thanks for being with us. And thank you. 